It's uh, Tuesday, January 26th. Welcome to the Selectmen's uh, uh, meeting. And uh, why don't we start with uh, uh, announcements and updates. Um, I'll start with uh, uh, a number of us uh, went uh, last Friday and Saturday to the uh, uh, Mass Municipal Association uh, conference, uh, which was uh, very interesting. Uh, they have uh, workshops, uh, uh, trade show um, uh, speeches. Uh, we heard uh, Governor Baker uh, tell us about uh, uh, local aid. There was good news coming out of that. I think we're looking at, a, they said, uh, in the governor's budget, a 4.3% Oh, and local aid. Or is that in no. Chapter 7? Just on, no, no. no it was unrestricted? On the unrestricted. Unrestricted. Fairly okay. small amount, but nonetheless, good news. Better than nothing. Yeah, better right. than nothing. And an increase in Chapter 70, about what we had expected. Okay. Right, yeah. So uh, it seems that uh, the, our local aid assumptions that were going into our budget appeared to be uh, pretty, pretty valid. Um, so that was uh, good news. Then there were uh, a number of uh, workshops. We heard from uh, Senators uh, Warren and uh, Markey. That was uh, very interesting. Got some of the stuff going on in Washington. Um, but it was, uh, uh, I thought, time uh, well spent. Um, heard about, I was in a zoning workshop, um, which uh, I found interesting, being a zoning nerd. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was at the luncheon um, with Maura Healy, where Maura, he Maura Healy spoke, um, and they are trying to, they're ex the Attorney General's office is actually expanding the number of offices it has across the state, and they're also uh, uh, pretty aggressively trying to uh, uh, work on the Narcan issue and getting Narcan to um, various uh, departments and municipalities. Um, so it was it was good. She was uh, she's a very vibrant speaker and uh, right. enjoyed it. Yeah. I attended also. Um, unfortunately, because of my other job, I couldn't make uh, Friday's uh, event. But I did attend the evening um, um, dinner, which was uh, very interesting. And the next day, I attended a very uh, useful, interesting workshop on policing. Among the uh, speakers was. Uh, Bill Evans, uh, Boston Police Commissioner. So we got got some interesting ideas and and uh, we had some interesting discussions. And then in the evening, Paula Poundstone. <laughs> she was really great, <laughs> as well as just willing to stay around for a long time afterwards and talk to people and take selfies with us. So <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So it was a great event. Yeah, yeah it's a great yeah. event and well worth our time. Yeah. Um, okay. Can I, can I just say that uh, three of us were at um, a joint meeting with the school committee last Thursday night to discuss the ninth school option. And, and I uh, will say that um, Selectman Franco is conflicted out. That's why he wasn't there. And Selectman uh, Green had another, uh, another event. But um, anyway, it, it, I think it continues to be difficult. Uh, and there's no good, clear options. Um, I guess um, the good news is people in South Brookline are actively lobbying to have a school there. And, um, not that's not necessarily the case for at least one neighborhood in North Brookline, but um, it, it still continues. It's going to be a tough choice, I think, and we're, right. we're kind of working through um, possibilities and what could be done with them and so forth. Right. Um, any other announcements, updates? Uh? Last, uh, last meeting, I think, we talked about uh, the event at the Teen Center in support of the uh, Sojourn to the Past. Uh, I attended that event and it was very, I thought it was very successful, very uh, uh, good event. And um, I think it's going to be a very inc an incredibly good experience for the students who are able to attend this, uh, this program. A, a journey through the South at various mm -hmm. sites of the Civil Rights Movement, speaking with people who were who were participants as well as um, as others. It's an it's a, uh, incredible learning experience. My son attended the first uh, time that Brookline participated. So, okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda: status update uh, 
on police officer allegations of discrimination. I'm going to uh, read a statement. Um, I'd like to address the issue of uh, Brookline police officers Pilot and Zurai Miskan. The debate that has ri arisen around this subject has been painful for all involved in our town, and I'm sure most of all for the officers. I'd like to clarify a few points. First, we care very much about officers Pilot and Zurai Miskan. Perhaps this hasn't been well communicated. We care about their safety, we care about their dignity, and want them to receive the respect they deserve at all times. They clearly don't feel that they've been listened to, and we want to address it. In order to work towards resolution and healing, to find a path forward with them, we must begin by hearing them. We need to understand in full their experience. This was our thinking when we offered mediation. I understand that they've rejected mediation and have instead joined the lawsuit that was filed in federal court. We still hope to talk to them and believe that any progress begins there. We're in the process of working on alternative approaches that we hope will address their concerns and create a path forward. More to come on that. We understand that additional plaintiffs have also been added to the lawsuit, and we're in process of reviewing their claims. We just received it today. At the same time, the independent investigation of the officer's complaints that's being conducted by General Reginald Nunnally is continuing and will go wherever the evidence takes it. I encourage anyone who's contacted by Mr. Nunnally to fully cooperate with this investigation. We'll keep you informed as to the progress. We don't have any sign-ups for public comment, so we're ready for the uh, miscellaneous calendar. Um, any uh, changes to the minutes of uh, January 19th? I gave some changes to um, Kate earlier. OK. And I will move the minutes uh, as amended uh, to be approved. All those in favor, say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Next item is a question of accepting a donation in the amount of $500 from the Korean Church of Boston to be used for community policing activities. Chief O'Leary. Sure. I think the chief has several, so you might want to do them ah, all while okay. he's up there. And we'll do, we'll, we'll do all of them. Sounds good so, to me. Okay. Good evening. Um, the first one is a donation that the Korean Church of Boston on Harvard Street. It's actually a continuing donation that they've given to the police department over the last several years. And um, this year it's in the amount of $500. And as in years past, we take it to support our community policing efforts to run different programs and to, um, to maybe buy some food when we're going to do an event around the community. And that's what we use it for. We hope the board will accept it on our behalf. Mm -hmm. The second one is a uh, child passenger safety equipment grant. For years now, we've been one of the few departments in the area that still uh, use tech, uh, police officers as technicians to install and to teach new parents um, the best way to keep their kids safe when in the car, their baby safe when in the car. Part of the time that we do this, um, we see that the seats that maybe some of the parents have are outdated. They're not safe anymore, and, but they can't afford a new seat. So. For the past several years, we have been applying for grant funding that will allow us to provide opportunities to parents that cannot afford their safety, child safety seats. We're provided to them at no cost. And we do have a number of families in Brookline that we've supported in the past, and this $2,000 will go a long way to help us <coughs> continue that this year. The third grant uh, deals with um, issues with underage alcohol usage. Um, we combine that uh, with our efforts to control the loud parties in certain areas of town, basically down around um, uh, Sector 1, which is down around uh, Pleasant Street and Freeman Street. But we also have an experience in some problems down at Brook Street and other problems up around Strathmore Road when you're close to the Erie Colleges. 
Uh, this allows us to um, provide patrols, extra patrols on Friday and Saturday nights, or at least in the early part of the semester, th Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. So the uh, students will get the message that they have to respect uh, the community that they're living in and the people that they're sharing space with. Uh, that grant is the amount of just under $10,000, $9,985.08. We also use that to run compliance checks to our liquor establishments and our restaurants, and um, that's what we would use that money for um, in the upcoming year. Questions, comments from the board? No, I want to again thank the uh, Korean Church for, for their generosity. Um, we appreciate it, uh, and uh, um, this year as we have in years past. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, so I will move uh, that we accept the donation in the amount of $500 from the Korean Church of Boston to be used for community policing activities. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And the chair votes aye. aye. Uh, I will move that we accept the grant in the amount of $9,985.08 from the Executive Office of Public Safety and Securities Highway Safety Division as part of the uh, fiscal year uh, 2016 Underage Alcohol Enforcement Grant Program. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman uh, Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And chair votes aye. And I'll move that we accept the grant from the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security's Highway Safety Division in the amount of $2,000 in connection with the fiscal year 2016 Child Passenger Safety Equipment Grant Program. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if I might ask the chief a question while before he leaves. I Certainly. assume you're not hanging around, so I want to ask you. Well, the, the marathon um, is before us tonight for their uh, a vote on allowing them to use our streets and uh, their special permit. And um, the, as you know, I have not been happy with the highly restrictive um, security that we've had in the past several years at the marathon. I think it's a huge um, burden to say to people they can't cross Beacon Street for hours and hours. You know, people with small children and whatever stuck on one side when they're trying to get home, people trying to get to the tea and whatever. So. Um, I, the last time, um, Mr. I, I don't know if I'm saying this right, Grillick, I think, I'm, um, was here. He made it quite clear that the marathon was not demanding that level of security, that it was originating here in town. And I'm looking at you, Chief. Yes. Um, so I, I want you to know that, I, and I want to know from you, if we're going to have that same level of uh, security, I'm going to have to vote against this. I'm, I'm probably the only one, but I'm going to make my, my uh, vote against it because I am hearing more and more complaints from my neighbors. We live pretty close to Beacon Street, and um, I, I just think that it's been way uh, too restrictive the last couple of years. It was understandable the first year after the bombing yeah. and when they had an extremely big field, but um, I think as an on ongoing procedure it's um, too much why, why don't we do this why don't we take the marathon special permit um, I, I believe this, this is uh, item 10 on the regular calendar so while the chief is here and the representative from the, uh, the BAA is here um, and you're Mr. Grillick right Actually, I'm uh, Mr. Flannery. Ah, okay. Flannery. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, since we're talking about it, we might as well talk about it <laughs> and be, be a little more efficient. So, uh, great. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Flannery. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, discuss the 120th Annual Boston Athletic Association Boston Marathon. I'll keep my remarks brief because it sounds like we'll have some questions at the end. So, uh, for all intents and purposes, the uh, Boston Marathon hasn't changed much in recent years besides uh, increased security posture, what we were just alluding to, uh, following the events of 2013. Our vision for 2016 is to work within the same roadway footprint 
uh, utilized in 2015, thus not impacting any additional roads. The 26.2 mile uh, rolling course is a point to point race starting in Hopkinton and finishing on Boylston Street in front of the Boston Public Library. The event for this year will take place on April 18, 2016 on Patriots Day. Start times have been uh, recognized as an 850 for mobility impaired, 917 the wheelchairs, 922 hand cycles, at 932 the elite women, and then at 10 o'clock we'll start our elite men with wave one, and then every 25 minutes thereafter we do three successive waves. Wave two at 1025, wave three at 1050, wave four at 1115. If the last runner runs about a 1345 pace, making them uh, eligible to finish the course in the six hour allotted time, uh, they'll pass the 24 mile point, which is in Brookline, the last mile point in Brookline, at about 4.45 p.m. It's expected by about 5.45 to have the roads reopened in Brookline. The field size this year is limited to 30,000 with four waves of 7,500 runners in each wave. Again, the time limit is six hours, and that's calculated from the time that the last person crosses the start line. We'll have water stations in the same locations as they have in the previous years. One will be at Beacon and Washington Street. One will be between Marshall Street and Kent Street. We're also planning to use three pedestrian crossways. One's at Beacon and Tappan, Beacon and Webster, and the last one's at Beacon and Hawes. We'll also have four medical stations on, through Brookline. Beacon and Dean Road, Beacon and Washington Street, Beacon and Harvard at Coolidge uh, Corner, and Beacon and Kent Streets. As always, we appreciate the strong support and coordination of the Brookline Police Department and Public Works. And as a formal matter, this authorization should include the right to exclusively, exclusively control and utilize the cross roadway and adjacent sidewalks and other appropriate areas to determine in our planning. This is to conduct a race in a safe and controlled manner. Included should be the permission to erect necessary course signage to locate the official BA water stations, the portage johns the Red Cross stations, computer chiming uh, mats, mile markers, and other official functions. As in previous years, the fluid stations will be manned by the BAA volunteers, and the uh, first aid stations will be manned by Red Cross, American Red Cross, under the auspices of the BAA. In order for the Boston Athletic Association to conduct a safe and successful marathon in Boston and the surrounding cities and towns on April 18, 2016, on behalf of the BA, I respectfully request that a parade permit or permission be granted to the BA. So, uh, can we talk about uh, Selectman Daly's concerns about crossing points and uh, um, and all the barricades? Yeah. So how, how's that going to work? This is, a, I get perhaps. Am I, sta am I correctly stating you are. your uh, position that it's not you guys demanding all of this, it's a local response? Correct. As a matter of fact, we went, we being the BAA, went to the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency uh, last month and asked Kurt Schwartz, the director, if we could you know, take things back a little bit so that we could open up the course a little bit. And the answer that we received is we're going to keep things consistent with what we have for the last two years. Could I ask, could I ask a question? When you put those barricades up, um, I mean, I, I have noticed in years past when there were no barricades, uh, sometimes someone wanted to cross the street, an elderly person, or someone who walked slowly. And, you know, it, it seemed to me that there was some danger there yes. um, in terms of people running and not being able to stop or not being able to get around the person. And so I'm wondering whether you, you like the barricades for that reason, um, or whether you would think that we don't need barricades in all locations. Well, again, the BAA, we would like to uh, avoid the restriction. We want to open up the courts. We want it to make it feel like it's a celebration for people to come out and see the marathon without being so restrictive. Our concern is, is you know, obviously the security measures that are going on with the recent things that have happened in Paris and San Bernardino. And, and we thought 
actually be going into that meeting that we might have a chance to actually start reducing some of the barricades and then those two events surfaced and so yeah but you know what the problem with the barricades is people who are penned up behind the barricades are kind of sitting ducks you know if, if there's some kind of uh, bomb threat or something you can't jump out of the way if you're kind of crammed behind the barricades that's one of my concerns that you're you're sort of uh, you know clustering people in such a way where they they couldn't escape if there was some incident so I feel well, like they panic in the yeah. stampede chief yeah. would you like to add something you know I, I think we've had this discussion each year and it is my plan to come and, and request that we go back we stay with the barricades and, and there's a couple of reasons for that the way the barricades are set up now you're going to get them from the finish line to, to the town line at Park Drive and if you, we were to take our barricades away then we would be wide open up until Cleveland Circle you're going to get barricades again all the way up to the end of the city of Boston the runners we're talking years ago the runners were probably 18,000 now you're over 30,000 runners so you're adding those people to it. Um, the Red Sox game is going to get out. You're going to get a lot of people. The only way to cross it, we're not going to have barricades in there, is in Brookline. We have at certain times, like two-hour period in the marathon, where you cannot get across the street. And we cannot be responsible for the runners, nor other people crossing the street, if we don't have the barricades. Last, the first year we did it, two years ago, granted, we shut the barricades down. We shut the street down. We sought to correct it last year. We work with the BAA to use a method that's used during the Disney World marathons. And there's three designated crossings that we plan on using again this year. Last year, those designated crossings were still there if we could use them. We told people to go to those barricades, to go to those intersections. Furthermore, we told people that the roads were going to be shut down. But, you know, people don't listen all the time. And I have to tell you, before even the barricades were put up there, we st still, after 100 years of that marathon running, we still had cars showing up wanting to get across Beacon Street. <laughs> so I don't know how much we can tell people. We told them to go there, and we'll get you across the street. And we did. No, but the problem is, is that it, it's been a very extended period of hours where you say, forget it. Even but if you come to these designated crossings, you can't cross. And that, that, is one, that is one of my big objections. You know, I think that I don't know if they adjust the schedule a little bit and allow a few more minutes between their waves that they're sending out. Yeah. Would that allow for some, uh, some, some lighter periods where people could cross or you, what? You have, to, you have to watch the marathon from the beginning. You get the wheelchairs coming down a really good clip really early on. And you can't account for opening up all the streets and letting them get across. We do accommodate. We did accommodate more than we did. We did accommodate last year more than we did the year before. We will accommodate more this year than we did either one of those years. But by the same token, I truly feel we have to have the barricades up there. If we don't have the barricades, it's all bets are off. And you get a lot of people converging in a very small area. Because I know there's going to be barricades at each one of our borders. And we'll, I think we'll be doing a disservice to people by not putting barricades up and protecting them in our town. Um, I'd like to ask another question. Um, have you considered, I don't, I don't recall you're using those message boards. You know, when the DPW um, shut down um, mm -hmm. around the bridge, and I think the use of those message boards was, was pretty effective from what I understand. And I'm wondering whether... Um, the use of message boards, you know, ahead of time to let people know that Beacon Street will be shut down or, or whatever uh, would help all along the, the route. The message boards have been used the last couple of years that we will be using them again. And I know that we use the message boards in various streets, not only <laughs> on Beacon, but adjoining streets to tell people when the road's going to be closed. But, you know, it, it go, <clears throat> we're at the end of the race. But the wheelchair riders get there in the beginning, and then you get different kind of runners. You know, then you get the elite runners, and then and then we get we're at the end of the race too. So where other cities and towns can can clean up and get out of there, we can't. Right. We're there from eight o'clock in the morning. We do roll calls. We have ro national guard in with us. We get back out. We get out to the street and we get set up, and then people start coming about. 
I don't know, 5, 11, 11 o'clock, wheelchairs start coming through. And then the race, race is on. And you're going to get the elite runners in. And it's going to continue through there. And um, I just think the safest way is to have those barricades up there. I, I want to thank the BAA for allowing us to uh, run what we call Team Brookline and sort of bundle these numbers together and raise some, uh, some funds for uh, valuable Brookline uh, charitable organizations, the Library Foundation and the Community Mental Health Center and um, a variety of other um, uh, service organizations. And, and it does a lot of good in this community. It helps to support vital services. So thank you for allowing uh, us to, to use the marathon uh, for our own selfish uh, reasons. Own selfish charitable Chari yeah. <laughs> <laughs> reasons. Well, I, I, I just want to add, first of all, I'd like uh, you, Chief, to consider using some kind of plastic barriers in the future. You know, if there's a bomb or something like that and you have metal barricades, not only are people held penned in behind them, but the, the barricades themselves become dangerous weapons. Um, the, the, um, uh, another thing is, one of my concerns is, um, I live in the area up near the um, Star Market on Beacon Street. And the people who, wanna, who need to take the tea home, who came by tea or whatever, they have to stand practically on the darn tea tracks to be on that side of the road. And I think it's, uh, I, it's a great concern to me because I've noticed with the barricades that they're pushed back almost, they used to kind of sit on the edge and maybe sit down on the curb. Now they're practically on the darn T tracks, and I think we're asking for trouble there. We had a crossing last year at Tavern Beacon. Yep. Mm -hmm. the crossing was set up right there. Mm -hmm. I took it myself when I went from one side of the beacon to the other. Make sure. It yeah, but if you can't cross for three hours or something, then you're you're kind of stuck. You have to stay on the no, on the T side. I think, I think the real grouping of the race is closer to two hours, and then it's just impossible. You, you just can't get across. The, the major, you know, part of the race is the, the four-hour time frame. So if we're looking at, you know, the first wave going off at 10 o'clock and, you know, you, then you're thinking three hours later and you're starting to get into that magic time frame where you're getting a critical mass of folks. And that's what the, the chief's talking about is there's a two-hour window there that there's a lot of runners that are coming through there. Chief, could I, could I ask you, my recollection was that even during the height of the race, there's this a mechanism that they used in the Disney where where um, the runners are actually shifted and yes. people cross halfway and then they shift again I, I did it with you yes. uh, in the middle of the race yes so it's not you can do that throughout the race I think at one point we had to shut down just because okay. it was so thick okay. but we got, we got we got across from stock market to the truck Are we comfortable to? I, I'll give it one more shot, but I'm, um, <laughs> and it's not, I've loved the marathon. I've always come down to watch it. Last year, I didn't come down. That was, uh, if, if you I, come down this year, you and I will cross the street. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay, so I will move that uh, we approve a special use permit for the running of the 2016 Boston Marathon scheduled for April 18th, 2016. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman uh, Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back, uh, pick up where we left off. And now we're back on item E of our miscellaneous calendar. And it's the question of approving the application of New England access doing uh, business as NETA, N-E-T-A, Amanda Rosatano, manager, holder of a registered marijuana dispensary at 160 Washington Street for the appointment of the following candidates um, as alternate managers. Brittany Cooper and Melanie Nash. Um, I don't think there's anyone here to speak to it. Um, and for assistant managers, we tend not to uh, ask them uh, uh, to, to come and, and present to us. Um, the police department has reviewed the application and uh, sees no reason to, uh, to, not, to deny the application. 
Uh, any comments, uh, questions from the board? Therefore, I'll, in order. Yeah. I'll, move, I'll move that we approve the application of New England Access, Inc., doing business as uh, NETA, Amanda Rosatano, manager, holder of a registered marijuana dispensary, license at uh, 160 Washington Street for the appointment of the following candidates as alternate managers. Brittany Cooper and Melanie W. Nash. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. And we have a number of uh, temporary uh, liquor licenses, and I'll move them in uh, omnibus fashion, and the police department has reviewed all the applications and uh, finds no reason to oppose the licenses. So I'll move that we grant the following temporary liquor licenses to Lars Anderson Auto Museum in connection with the following events to be held at 15 Newton Street, Wine and Malt for the annual museum party on January 30th from 5.30 to 11, Dancing with the Cars, I always get a chuckle out of that, uh, February 12th, uh, 2016, 6 to 11, and an all kinds alcohol for a wedding reception on February 20th, 2016 from 4.30 to 10.30. And I'll also move that we grant a temporary wine and malt beverage license to Vine Ripe Grill in connection with the following events to be held at 1281 West Roxbury Parkway, January 30th, 2016, music night from 3.30 to 6. February 11th, 2016, a panel discussion, 5.30 to 7.30. And uh, February 29th, oh, it's a leap year, uh, 2016, for a meeting from 6 to 10. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Now we're ready to go to our main calendar. Um, first, we have a reserve fund transfer. Um, and the question approving to the advisory committee the request of town council Jocelyn Murphy for reserve fund transfer in the amount of $165,000 for the following accounts, $45,000 litigation and $120,000 general counsel. Welcome, Ms. Murphy. Good evening, Chairman Wyshynski, members of the board. I respectfully see in advance of approaching the advisory committee under Chapter 40, Section 6, I request your approval of a reserve fund transfer in the amounts described by Chairman Wyshynski um, I'm joined this evening by Chief Assessor um, Gary McCabe as I'm seeking this um, reserve fund transfer to cover costs related to a number of matters in litigation, one of which is a matter with which he is particularly familiar involving um, utilities. Um, the cases that are presently in litigation are described in the memorandum dated January 22nd that um, has been provided to you prior to this meeting, they involve cases that are ongoing litigation that are either in, in uh, motion or um, trial stages. Um, they al it also includes the litigation in the matter of Town of Brookline versus the residences of South Brookline, which as you know is presently um, postured in the land court. Um, I'm also seeking a transfer for litigation expenses, that is expenses related n not for outside counsel but for administrative and lit litigation expenses related to those matters. I note that there's an error on page two, the figure should be um, that I'm seeking is for $45,000 um, for a transfer to, to the litigation account in the legal department. Yeah, Happy the, to answer the amount questions. is correct in the uh, calendar. And on the first page. Right. Any questions, comments from the board? These are all matters we're familiar with. Excuse me, I'm out of line, but I didn't want to ask Jocelyn. You're not returning my emails. Just, uh, okay, why don't you guys talk afterwards? I'm not, I'm not a good line resident. I'm a blocking resident. Okay, you, can, you guys can talk to each other afterwards. Okay, so uh, uh, any questions, comments from the board? I will therefore move that we approve and transmit to the advisory committee the request of town council Jocelyn Murphy for a reserve fund transfer in the amount of 
$165,000 for the following accounts, $45,000 litigation, $120,000 general counsel. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item is a question of approving and transmitting to the advisory committee the request of uh, Human Services, Human Resources Director uh, Sandra DeBow for a reserve fund transfer in the amount of $200,000. Ms. DeBow. Good evening. My name is Sandra DeBow. I'm the HR Director for the town. Um, we are asking for a request of reserve fund transfer um, for $200,000 to fund our human resources budget for outside labor and employment council. Um, similar to last year, these higher costs are due primarily to two, um, two employee matters that are being heavily litigated. Uh, they are, were being litigated in multiple forum. They are now going forward in one forum. Um, one was just settled. Unfortunately, the other one is just heating up and we, we've uh, started the discovery Based on that. Uh, another thing that is attributing to um, the costs is that we've had an atypical number of arbitrations regarding employee discipline. Part of this has to do with just actions that we've taken um, recently, but others are also because we had, um, since we were short in funds last year, moved them into the prior, uh, the litigation into the subsequent um, fiscal year, and so we're bearing the cost of that now. Um, during One of the things I'm happy to report is last year, uh, part of the cost increases that we had had to do with unfair labor practices that AFSCME was filing as a tactic, I would say, um, in conjunction with the grievances. We've worked very hard with them this year. Our costs of um, unfair labor practice charges against AFSCME has plummeted to almost none. Um, unfortunately, as you all are well aware, that we have um, less than happy relations with fire department, um, which is now going to the JLMC, and we've seen an increase and an uptick in not only grievances, but unfair labor practices with regard to them, as is typical um, when you have protracted um, negotiations. So. Uh, our monthly costs typically hover around 12 to 14,000. Um, they have been um, upwards of 30,000, an average of 30,000 uh, from July until November. Um, we unfortunately <coughs> expect that this is going to, going to continue through the rest of the year. All our collective bargaining agreements, are, except for police, um, have just expired and we're going to be at the main table with each one of those. So um, we are working diligently with the budget, um, with the assistant town administrator and town council to look at how we use outside uh, council, how we refer certain matters to um, the town council's office, <coughs> and um, again, uh, trying to improve our relations um, and keep them uh, more collaborative with uh, some of the unions that we've had issues with most recently. Questions? I, I want to commend you for working with um, the Assistant Town Administrator and Town Council to try and figure out an alternative way to fund some of these costs rather than going to the reserve fund. I think it's um, this is the second year or maybe the third year in a row that we've had to do a transfer like this and I think it's responsible budgeting practice to sort of figure out alternative ways. So thank that's, you for, for taking the bull by the horns there. Okay. I will uh, <coughs> therefore move that we uh, approve and transmit to the advisory committee a reserve fund transfer in the amount of $200,000 for the uh, Human uh, Resources Department. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman aye. Daly? Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And the chair votes <coughs> aye. Next item is uh, the question of adopting a resolution honoring uh, preservation planner Greer Harwick uh, for 30 plus years of uh, dedicated service and uh, uh, Dr. Harwick is uh, retiring uh, Hardwick it's not it's not correct in the in, in the calendar um, Dr. Hardwick is uh, retiring I've had the 
pleasure of uh, working with her in various capacities uh, <coughs> uh, for the last probably 10-ish years. Uh, I, I met her in my role as on the Planning and Reg Committee of, uh, of Advisory, and she's always been a pleasure to work with. She's been instrumental in the creation of a number of uh, historic districts. Um, uh, she's been instrumental in the creation of the, uh, the two uh, neighborhood conservation districts and the whole concept of uh, neighborhood conservation districts. So she has quite a uh, legacy that she has uh, left us. Um, she does, and I, I uh, very much appreciated all, all the work she's done. Uh, the historic districts, uh, I was involved in, in um, lobbying for Graf and McKay. And, um, but just beyond that, she's a very professional. Uh, she's very professional. She um, looks at all, all, uh, all the sides of the issue. And I believe that uh, you know we will miss her very, very much. Yeah, I'll say I'm. I'm uh, I've worked with Greer for many years, and I'm always impressed about the just the vast extent of her knowledge of various uh, places in Brookline. And I've got I've got to say in the proclamation, I love the part where it talks about her file drawers overflowing with property reports and other invaluable materials and creating a massive electronic library. So it's good, at, it, we're s sincerely gonna miss her because so much of it is uh, in, her, in her mind, but I'm glad that she has her overflowing file drawers. <laughs> so hopefully the next people that come along will be able to benefit from that. Uh, I've also had the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Hardwick. Um, and the thing that always struck me about her is she makes the history come alive. She clearly knows a lot about Brookline and uh, over the centuries, um, but she conveys that information in an engaging way uh, uh, and, um, and really uh, paints a vivid picture of, of what's happened before and, and therefore where we're, we might be going in the future. So best wishes on, uh, on happiness uh, in retirement, health, and uh, I hope she, she's successful and finds something to occupy your time. Um, any other comments? Uh, this is a proclamation that's going to be presented to her. There's a retirement event on Thursday, on Thursday I believe. Thursday, yes. Um, so I will read it into the record. I don't think you have to read it into the record. Okay, then uh, I will. <laughs> I will not read it into the I, record. I think the, the sentiments uh, in the uh, proclamation, we've expressed it uh, without going through uh, all the, uh, the whereases and the therefore, but I'll, I'll, I'll read the therefore. Okay. Uh, we, we, the members of the Board of Selectmen, Town of Brookline, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, hereby extend our deepest appreciation and profound gratitude on behalf of the town of Brookline, formerly known as Muddy River. It's only in, in <laughs> Dr. Hardwick's uh, <laughs> proclamation that that gets in there to Dr. Greer Hardwick and extend to her our best wish, wishes for future happiness, health, and success. We're missing the uh, Muddy River part of Boston. Right. <laughs> yeah. There is a, uh, an event that uh, either myself or any board member who is attending on Thursday uh, evening uh, will be, be presenting this. Okay. Yes, I, I've signed up to go. Yeah, I have a conflict. So yeah, unfortunately. I, I should be there. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor of adopting the resolution honoring preservation planner Greer Hardwick for her 30 plus years of dedicated service. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman uh, Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Next item, uh, we've already done the uh, Boston Marathon, is the presentation of the uh, audit report. Oh. Selectman Daly has switched sides, so uh, Selectman well, Daly. I, I hope you all enjoyed reading these as much as I did. At, uh, I'm, I am the chair of the audit committee, um, and um, I want to thank my fellow members of the committee. Um, three of them are CPAs, Greg Grobstein, Jim Littleton, and Peter Flaherty. We're all appointed by the moderator. Um, we also have Beth Jackson Stram, who represents the school committee. Lee Selwyn represents the advisory committee, and we, the ex officio members are Steve Cirillo, our finance director, Michael DiPietro, our controller, Mary Ellen Dunn, the Deputy Superintendent of Schools for Finance, and 
Melissa Goff, our Deputy Town Administrator. And uh, I did say to Melissa that she uh, was, was well up on her predecessor because she actually attended our meeting this year. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, uh, I'm going to introduce in a minute Craig Peacock, if you want to sort of start heading this way, who's a partner with um, Powers and Sullivan and conducted the audit. But um, basically what happens, our fiscal year, as you know, ends on June 30th, and um, immediately um, Mike and Steve start putting together the records that the auditors are going to need, and they come in in August. Usually late July to start. Late July, yeah. And I will say that they have uh, continued to compliment um, Mike and Steve and all our staff for how well organized the material and how complete the material is when they get here and they're able to sort of hit the ground running. So um, the basically, the, the Craig will tell you more about this, but they found sufficient information. Um, which is they look for gaps and things like that. They did not find any gaps. Um, to um, conclude that you know, the records the, were in order and that there were no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies and they didn't have to qualify the reports. That's, um, that language is uh, the language that's commonly used in the, in the CPA world in the audit business to say it was a clean audit. Right. Um, so we, um, I, I have put, uh, if you look on the second page of my report to you from the audit committee, you'll see some of the numbers there. Um, the, the perhaps um, among, the, among the more interesting number is our liability on OPEBs, which is 220.7 million. We currently have 26 0.06 million in a, a fiduciary managed trust fund for that obligation. So we are not yet at the ARC, which the ARC is the um, required annual contribution to fund within a 30-year schedule. That's what we do with our pensions. We're not yet there on uh, the OPEBs, but we keep ramping up. And, and I want to keep reminding people, especially since Steve is going to be leaving us soon and won't be here to remind people that it was when we had a committee and looked at this a few years ago, it was our recommendation that when the pension fund gets fully funded, we uh, would like and expect to see that, that the, the funding that we've been putting toward pensions would then go toward the OPEB liability and that would certainly uh, move us along quite a bit. But Craig can tell you a little bit about how um, in general, our plan, we are ahead of most other cities and towns in the Commonwealth uh, on funding that OPEB liability and, and our efforts, while, not, while we're not yet on the ARC, our efforts are meeting with approbation uh, in the, um, by the, the, the people, the rating agencies that, that give us our, our, our what's been our AAA bond rating for many years, and we hope to continue with that. Um, so they did give us a few areas where we could improve. Um, the, basically, the schools, revolving funds, and student activity funds, that's kind of been a perennial uh, thorn in the side. Um, Mary Ellen Dunn, who's sort of new in her position as Deputy Superintendent for Finance, has vowed to us uh, that she's going to get right on working on some of those issues. Um, they also recommended that we raise our threshold for capitalizing and depreciating fixed assets from 15,000 to 50,000. So they're actually recommending that we loosen our controls in that area a little bit, um, just saying that we're, you know, keeping too much small stuff kind of on the books, I think. So I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Powers and Sullivan partner Craig Peacock to... to Thank you. Uh, Mr. Peacock. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for having me. Nancy, I think, just summed up the audit quite well, uh, so I'll try to add some extra uh, to that. Again, the audit is generally uh, done in two phases. The preliminary phase is usually done, as Nancy mentioned, late July, early August. Uh, I think a real key to that, the reason I wanted to mention that was many, many clients we're not able to get in in 
early August. We're not ended up there until maybe late August, September, October. Your finance director has typically for many years now had great controls in place to assure that cash, receivables, long-term debt are reconciled on a monthly basis in very timely. So we're able to get in at the end of July, early August and actually look at your June 30th cash figures, receivable figures, debt figures, which is, I almost don't, I don't have another client, not even close to the size of Brookline that we're able to do that so early. So that, that's a very big benefit to him. <clears throat> Excuse me. The year-end work generally happens right around Labor Day. Uh, this year it lasted for three weeks, which is very consistent with the years past. We left the field right about September 20th. Drafts were issued about September 29th, in which we worked with your finance director and comptroller to uh, have them first review the drafts, go through them, make any recommendations. At that point, we would reissue a draft to, both, to Nancy and the full audit committee. Uh, met with the audit committee in early November to talk about any questions, concerns that they would have. And at that point, we went, you know, we all go back and forth for a week or two on some changes, and the reports were issued in early December. Quite frankly, for a town the size of Brookline, with all that's going on, great timeline as far as our firm is concerned. Uh, we have many clients that, that could not meet that timeline. Some of the noteworthy things to talk about, Nancy mentioned, we, the town again received an unmodified opinion on your financial statements, and we'll see on your uh, report of federal award programs. That is the best opinion that the town could receive. That's what you would hope to receive. Again, you will see that there are no major internal control weaknesses noted. Again, meaning there are no significant deficiencies and material weaknesses noted in either the management letter or the federal report. Uh, that you know, that just that speaks volumes for the town. As long as we've been affiliated with the town, we've never had a material weakness or a significant deficiency. Uh, some other noteworthy things for this year. Again, the audit went very smooth. And what I mean by that is your department heads mainly are, you know, the main departments we work with are your finance director, treasurer collector's office, your comptroller and his team. Everybody was very prepared for us, had a great package available for us once we hit the field. That, that speaks volumes. We're able to hit the ground running and be very efficient in conducting the audit. Responses to our questions were timely. Information was provided timely. As an auditor, what that says is sometimes you'll go to a client, you'll ask a particular question. Well, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. They're working late those couple of days to get you the answers. The questions here are answered timely. Information is provided timely. That tells you that there are procedures occurring routinely on a monthly basis in which your ledgers your cash, again, receivables are being reconciled. Uh, couldn't ask for anything better than that. The AR collections, again, continued to be great at 98 to 99% in the first year. Something new this year that you, you may have noticed, uh, Nancy mentioned the OPEB, we'll get to that one, but new this year was Gatsby 67 and 68. It, uh, brought on the requirement of the net pension liability having to actually be reflected on the face of the financial statements. It had been within the footnotes for many years. However, this year for the town of Brookline, we had to record uh, $184 million net pension liability on your financial, on the full accrual financial statements. However, uh, what I'd like to say is the town's been actively working to fund the unfunded liability on the pension side so that some of those funds can be opened up to maybe start thinking about and working towards more funding for the OPEB. Um, what you'll see is the town is still on target for a 2030 funding of the unfunded pension liability, which is 10 years prior than current legislation allows. <coughs> and we probably have a very small handful of clients that are anywhere in that ballpark. Most have chosen to go out to 35, 38, 40 to buy themselves some leeway there. So, you know, really, 
it's a pleasure to come and work with the town and your, your different offices, department heads, because we get the feeling that everybody really cares. Everybody has a stake in it. Many of your department heads live in and around town. Uh, boy, they keep us on our toes. There's many clients we go to that we may send out a set of drafts, and within about an hour you get a phone call and we're ready to issue. It tells you nobody's really looking at them. You have an audit committee that's second to none. We, we have multiple meetings. They ask lots of good questions. So we, we have to always be on our toes and really understand what's going on within the town. A um, Couple other things to note. Yeah, we may as well move on to, to the OPEB for a moment. Uh, Nancy mentioned there's a, about $26 million put aside. I looked today throughout our client base and I could find only one client that had more money put aside in the trust currently for OPEB. So kudos for that. that I know you have an OPEB committee, you're always looking into it, finding ways to, to work towards that liability. Uh, having $26 million aside is wonderful at this point in time. There is no mandate to fund that liability, so this proactiveness is going to reap benefits in the future. Just as Gatsby 67 and 68 came into play this year and required the net pension liability to be recorded on the books, in fiscals 17-18, there will be Gatsby 74-75 that's coming into play that is going to require the OPEB liability to also be recorded on the books. Um, currently, there is an OPEB liability on the books if you look, but really all that is is the delta between the ARC, what's required each year, and what we actually make on a pay-as-you-go basis. The new GASB is going to require the actuarial unfunded liability, just as they are for net pension liability, to be recorded on the town's financial statements. Again, that'll be in fiscal 18. Some other important items to note this year uh, for the general fund budget, town meeting uh, Approximately, there was about $7.2 million approved to balance the budget of both free cash overlay available funds because of strong collections and your department's abilities to control costs. Ultimately, only $800,000 of that was needed to balance the budget for this year. So that's remarkable. Uh, debt service continues to be at approximately 4% of budget. Sometimes we might say that 4% could be a little low, but at the same time, when you look at the CIP program that the town of Brookline prepares and undertakes and is always also funding that with available funds, so if you really looked at the, the cash out the door, it's commendable. We have a, a really strong uh, CIP program. Um, utilizing again a small percentage of the overall budget for the debt service and again all the fund balance policies that the town uh, works towards allows some free cash available funds to be used for the CIP program. Right that's uh, that's going to adjust uh, once uh, devotion school comes online. <laughs> yes. But that's all uh, planned for. Uh, this year, again, your unassigned fund balance of the general fund ended at approximately $22.6 million. Uh, important to note that that includes $6.2 million stabilization fund, which is required to be reported in the general fund under GASB 54. Uh, that clearly helps the policies and procedures in place in the town to work on your fund balance, to maintain a certain level of reserves, main, certainly helps in maintaining the town's AAA balance, uh, AAA rating, excuse me. Um, overall, we couldn't be happier with the way the audit went. The financial teams was, were very prepared, they're very engaging. Um, that's kind of a nutshell of the financial statements. I could go into the, the, we have the report on federal award programs and the management letter. Can answer any questions that you might have at the end. Uh, the report on federal award programs for fiscal 15, the town spent five and a half million dollars of federal funds. We were required to audit the Title I program and the special education cluster, which accounted for about $2.6 million or 47% of those overall federal expenditures. 
Happy to say as well on that report, the town received unmodified opinions. There are no question costs. There were a few minor, uh, what we would call compliance issues um, uh, with one of the programs, but nothing that rose to the level of material weakness, significant deficiency on that report. So again, that is a clean report for the town. The management letter had four previous co four comments that were reported in the previous fiscal year, three of which were completely resolved. One uh, that Nancy referred to as far as some revolving funds, uh, that was my understanding is there was some new personnel hired in the school department uh, that will be working on that with the expectation that that should be resolved in fiscal 16. And uh, there were three new comments this year. Uh, again, nothing that rose to significant deficiency, material weakness, some recommendations on handling of some student activity funds. We did recommend what we've seen since the implementation of GASB 34, many communities used anywhere from five to $15,000 as their threshold <coughs> for fixed asset capitalization. And now anywhere from you know eight years or so, eight, six to eight years, depending on your implementation date of GASB 34, we're finding that the benefit to maintaining such a low threshold, and we want to just separate, there's a difference between inventory control that the town might be interested in, in knowing all of your computers and copiers and so on, and fixed asset reporting for GASB 34 and your financial statement purposes. So what we found is 50,000 uh, for a, a, ta a, a town the size of Brookline, really helped the comptroller's office and such to kind of weed out a lot of the smaller items that you know maybe not have a, a, a really extended shelf life if you will economic life so we recommended that and the last comment in this year's report was what we would refer to as an informational comment and it referred to uh, what we just spoke about gasby 74 and 75 and the opeb liability uh, being brought onto the books in fiscal 18. So uh, I'd like to ask about the effect of uh, GASB 74 and 75. And I'm looking at the statement of uh, net position on yes. uh, page 31. And now the uh, post-employment benefits, the OPEBs, is reported at just under $53 million. Correct. So under the, 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 the GASB 74 and 5, um, we would have to report the whole $220 million. Will that that will then give us a negative net position. Is, is that going to change the way people like the rating agencies are going to look at us? Well, what we found thus far, and again, the, the OPEB liability as well as the net pension liability are only recorded on the town's full accrual financial statements. Currently, generally speaking, the rating agencies are focusing on your budgetary statements and what we call your modified accrual, the fund-based statements. So we're always in talks with both Moody's and Zandon Poor's to understand what are you looking at, how is this going to impact it, and another factor is that it is not just the town of Brookline, it's going to be right. every Massachusetts community. And with the net pension liability being recorded this year, I would have to suggest that upwards of 60% of our clients are already in a negative position overall. So the the recognition of this OPEB liability in a few years is going to bring that, you know, much higher deficit. And I think what they're finding is currently there's not a funding mechanism for OPEB or a, requ a requirement to fund. So in our talks with them, they're able to look at the town of Brookline. Again, we said you have the town has $26 million put aside. What they're going to do is say, who are Brookline's peers and what have they done? We're finding other communities that may have not done anything yet. That's, that may start to detrimentally impact their rating because all of their peers are in fact starting. Again, I look today at the town of Brookline, exemplary. There's only one client that I found that has more money put aside. Um, so I think we're, we're right on track, doing what we're supposed to, really being proactive, thinking about how we're going impact, uh, you know, how can we impact this OPEB liability. And again, uh, as Selectman Daly mentioned, uh, once we reach in 2030 the unfunded liability on the pension, the idea and hope is to be able to shift some of those <coughs> funds over to OPEB and really start to 
fund this liability, this future liability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Questions from the board? Selectman Franco? I had a question about the, uh, the federal um, award programs. Uh, I was wondering if you could go just into a little bit more detail about this finding that um, the, uh, the expenditures reported on the FR1 uh, didn't reconcile with the amount in the town's general ledger. That sounds troubling, and I want to just make sure I fully understand what you're saying there. Yes. Um, I will say this is a somewhat common finding amongst clients, and the reason being is a fisc the, the town's fiscal year ends on June 30th, Grant years go till the end of August. And so what happens is there's always that disconnect between the fiscal and the grant year. And really it, it ends up just a lot of times being the timing. Um, we, if, if you remember correctly, over the last few years, we've had a very similar comment on some other grants of the school department. They've been able to reconcile those and, and provide support to us. Uh, this year on the special education in the Title I, we, we were not able to get there. We got very close uh, in meeting with the new uh, superintendent, uh, excuse me, uh, Deputy Superintendent of Administration and Finance, uh, Mary Ellen Dunn, uh, in the audit committee meeting. She expressed uh, uh, a sincere hope and expectation to be able to you know, achieve that all of these to implement procedures to assure that all grants reconcile with the general ledger. More than, you know, I, we, we couldn't get there this year. I can't give you the 100% answer that says I got there and here's why. Generally speaking, in years past and with other clients, it ends up being some sort of a timing difference between the cutoff at June 30th and the cutoff in August and the reports that are being used. Once we give a little time, they're usually always able to be reconciled. We've never had a question cost, which would come in if we found something being improperly charged to a grant that has never come up. So 90% of the time, it's really just timing. However, following the compliance requirements in the way that we're required to audit the grants, we don't have a lot of leeway to say, we're not going to consider this a finding. If we can't get there, yep. it's essentially a finding. Any other questions? Um, one thing I noted, and I don't, I don't know if this is a standard thing. I, I, I think there was some discussion of it in past years. Is a sensitivity uh, analysis of uh, the different uh, uh, interest rate assumptions on the pension liability. I found that very illuminating. Um, I that, is, that is a new disclosure this year in relation to Gatsby 6768. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, that was uh, that's very interesting to me. I also noticed, and maybe this is a question from Mr. Cirillo, um, looking at the actuarial assumptions. Um, okay, uh, we've lowered our investment rate return uh, prudently, I think, to 7.6 percent, but there's also an inflation rate. Uh, assumption of 4.5 percent. That that just hits me as a little high. Um, um, yes, there are actually there are many many <coughs> right, assumptions, many, yeah, of course, that are ba baked into uh, a constructed number because the actuary is a constructed number of what your unfunded liability is. Uh, one of the inflation rates is the inflation on salaries. Another inflation rate is the annual appropriation increase in annual appropriation. Uh, all of these are in play. Uh, I would say the, um, the inflation rate on salaries has been dropping because uh, we uh, have, over the past few years, lowered our estimated uh, settlements. Uh, that, along with the overtime and other issues, brings it to an overall amount of about four and a quarter to four and a half percent. In past years, it's been over five. Uh, the inflation, the annual increase in the operating budget at this point in the last actual, which, which was two years ago, uh, was 5.6%. Uh, that is likely to increase uh, in the next actuary, which in fact is beginning right now. It will probably be concluded in June. 
Uh, and the reason for that is if you look around at, at what has occurred in the market from January 1st of 15 through December 31st of 15, uh, did not meet anybody's expectations of, of the final rate of return. And so that has to be offset by adjustments in the, in the other variables. Yeah, I have a couple questions uh, directed to you, Mr. Cirillo. I, I think, I mean, that, that since uh, the financial report is as of June 30, there are certain things that were said uh, in the 2015 uh, grant year to have been uh, planned to be corrected, the findings, uh, by uh, December 31st, 2015. And that's the um, filing of the final financial report. Um, and uh, the um, reconciliation of um, th th that we talked about earlier. Have those things actually been accomplished in fiscal year 2015, <coughs> the end of the grant uh, uh, year? And I think the other date is October 31st. Uh, those year? are the, the two findings in the school department. Right. Uh, uh, my understanding is that they have not yet been completed. However, I think that they're near completion. So, so we did not meet the estimated completion date on those. Okay. It's not the end of the world. I'm not suggesting right, that. Right. Uh, that that was a re that was a comment that that was our estimated recommendation. As a matter of fact, it was the school department's estimated recommendation, uh, estimated date of mm -hmm. of completion. Um, however, a uh, couple of things. First of all, we have a new deputy superintendent of finance, uh, and. Uh, the audit, our audit, began uh, really in July, and those recommendations came out in October of 15. So uh, the deputy believed that they would be done by the end of December. I believe that they're nearly done now. I, I just want to point out that that is the school department's responsibility. To no, do I understand, that. but it's in our, it's in our A133 report. I'd like to make a comment. Um, for several years, I was a member of our, what we call our advisory committee, which is statutorily a finance committee of the town. And, um, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that we don't talk about enough, probably, is how well managed the town's finances are. And sitting on this side now of, of the, um, in the municipal, um, government, I see even more uh, how, uh, what a good job we do. You know, doing a good job is not, not sexy news. It's not, no one wants to really talk about it that much. They'd rather talk about the issues and the problems, which it's understandable. But I do think that, um, that we need to real realize that we are doing a, a great job, and you've just confirmed that. Um, in terms of municipal finance, and that's obviously one of our very most important functions. I, I just want to say, I, I, Craig, I can't remember whether it was you or Dick Sullivan, but, but one of you commented that the town of Brookline had more good financial policies and procedures in place than any of your other um, clients, and you often recommended that people kind of look to our leadership on that. And, and I want to just say, because this is... Steve's last go round on this that um, I, I think he's leaving us with a wonderful legacy in that he has really put many of those policies and procedures in place. Steve, could we persuade you to stay on for a while longer? <laughs> <laughs> well, Don't answer. I will always be close <laughs> Well, uh, uh, Selectman Daly uh, stole my thunder um, that, uh, of course, this is uh, Mr. Cirillo's. Uh, uh, last uh, rodeo with, with with the audit, um, and uh, it's I, I've been on the board now, I guess, going on three years, and uh, it's it's very. Uh, this is the third audit report that I've heard that that uh, ha has been presented in such uh, uh, glowing terms about uh, our uh, procedures and internal uh, controls and, and and management practices. Um, our, our, the way we construct our CIP and, 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 and manage our debt. Um, I think uh, a, a lot of it is a testament to uh, uh, Steve and his uh, team, and I'll just echo that uh, 
uh, you have uh, left us a, a wonderful legacy and uh, uh, something f uh, that your predecessor, your successor, is going to uh, really come into a really strong uh, position. Um, it, it's not like uh, successors coming in to clean anything up. Successors coming in to carry on the legacy, and I think that's wonderful. So thank you. So I should say the audit committee voted unanimously to accept the reports, and we would recommend that you do as well. Okay, so I guess uh, I should move uh, that we accept uh, the, uh, uh, the audit report from Powers and Sullivan, um, dated uh, for the year ended uh, June 30th, 2015. All those in favor? Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your Thank time. You. We have a number of board and commission uh, interviews. And the first one up is uh, John Harris for the Bottled Water Study Committee. Mr. Harris, tell us what brings you to this committee. I know you've been active in this issue. Uh, well, basically my concern is uh, I'm not a, not a scientist. I'm a concerned citizen. Uh, I was a history major in college, and uh, but I've long been a member of a group called Center for the Science Center for Science and the Public Interest, and um, uh, you may know of them. Uh, Michael Jacobson, who has a PhD in uh, from uh, MIT, and I think it's chemistry, is their founder and director. Um, very. Uh, astute science-based organization and that is mostly uh, centered on nutritional issues. And um, in the year 2005, they came out with a book called Liquid Candy, How Soft Drinks Are Harming Americans' Health. And it's all about uh, sugar soda. And um, later on, when the, uh, the move to ban bottled water I thought, bottled, well, first of all, when later on when bottled water came about, I thought bottled water was insane uh, to pay money for something you just pull out of your tap, basically. But, Unless you live in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> emergency, yeah, yeah. But, um, but then after that, uh, I had an event uh, working, I spent many years working in human service agencies, and uh, uh, a number of our people, of our direct care staff were, um, uh, you know, inner city people, um, not highly educated, who um, basically would bring bottles of soda in to work every day and brandish them through the day, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, wholesale, as if it had been coordinated, they, these bottles of soda suddenly became bottles of water. And uh, I had no idea why until I started watching the TV shows that they would turn on during their shifts. And, and the uh, you know, the, the bottled beverage industry had started a huge television campaign, um, uh, you know, to encourage uh, purchasing bottled water. And I was amazed at how it worked with these people, how successful it was. Um, in a sense, I still thought of bottled water as kind of crazy, because why pay for something that you can pull out of your tap? But Boy, it got people away from bottled soda. And, and many of these people, both the staff and the clients in my agencies, were overweight. Um, they all came from, or <coughs> virtually all came from families where chronic diseases began in, the, in, their, of, in their 40s, uh, became serious in the 50s, and then very serious mortality rates in, in their 60s. The kind of diseases that basically affect, uh, you know, higher income and, and more years of education people uh, tw easily 20 to 30 years later. So, um, so I, you know, became very uh, concerned about this issue. And then when the anti-bottled water uh, movement began, I'm going to say, what was that, maybe 10 years ago, something like that. Um, uh, you know, I kind of, uh, you know, scratched my head why uh, you know, since, since bottled water is just a small part of the whole universe of all of these bottled beverages, 
why are you just focusing on bottled water? And I noticed that the people who were so adamant in wanting to ban bottled water were from very small, very wealthy, uh, uh, you know, towns, uh, and a very small number of them, the main one being Concord, Massachusetts. Um, I know there was also, and very, very uh, expensive elite colleges as well. Um, these movements were not coming from major cities where there were huge problems with obesity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I just, um, that's where I come from on this. Okay. Yeah. Um, questions from the board? I don't see any. So uh, thank you, Mr. Harris. Oh, okay. Okay, that was easy. Okay. Is this going to be a very, is this a competitive? Uh... Um, we've had, I think you're the second or third person to uh, interview. Um, how many are we looking for, Selectman Green? Uh, probably four or five. Okay. Four or five. Yeah. Okay. And are there more interviews scheduled or have more people applied? Or? I don't believe so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. So we're hoping to get it going pretty soon. Looking good for you, right at this right. point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, let me just say, you know, I, I unless we find something else. Yeah, right. but I, I, I think it's important on this committee and all committees that we try to have a balance sure. yeah. committee, different Absolutely. points of view. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, one of my conceptions of this committee would be, and as I said in my uh, letter of application last June, is that. Uh, it, this is a fant could be a fantastic educational platform on the on the entire issue, on uh, the environmental impacts, and the human health impacts of both the containers we're talking about, the plastic bottles, etc., and the liquids inside <coughs> those containers. So, um, and there are various movies, uh, there are various speakers. It turns out that there are a number of uh, of uh, epidemiologists, etc., at both. Um, uh, I know of several at the Harvard School of Public Health, Harvard Medical School, and uh, there's a particular expert at Tufts University, emeritus now, but he might be interested in, in speaking to the group, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And um, because this is an issue of major public health implications, I would love to do all of this in a kind of a public, uh, you know, a major public forum kind of way. Um, there's, uh, you know, the, the Public Health Week is coming up, uh, what is it, I think the first or second week in May, uh, kind of short notice at this point. I think that's when it is. So uh, it's possible that some events related to this could be plugged into that uh, or at, at some other date. Um, would the committee be, I, 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 I've forgotten when the, the vote was held last spring, was it going to be a one-year reporting time or indefinite or? Was there a deadline on it? Um, I believe the deadline was um, next town meeting. I think that that's you know, not really practical at this point. Okay, um, good. Yeah, I think that in addition to being an educational program with, uh, uh, process with respect to you know, the uh, impact of bottled water, as you say, as well as other uh, beverages, I mean, this is going to be an important and, and not easy uh, educational process with respect to um, the, the infrastructural issues that, you know, really have to be addressed before we can even talk about mm -hmm. asking people not to use bottled water. I mean, the Flint, Michigan case, of course, is an extreme situation, but, um, you know, in our parks, do we have the type of infrastructure that, that would allow people to uh, bring their water bottles and get them filled up instead of, uh, you know, stopping by a convenience store if they can find one um, and, and buying a, you know, bottle uh, of water? So, um, you know, it's going to be an interesting and very important process, and, um, you know, we look forward to, to doing it. I would love to get speakers on both sides of the issue. Well, I if you, if you can give some names, you know, we, we would consider them. Okay, I would love okay. to. Well, as a member of the committee, I could organize yeah. those, people, right. those people myself, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. as I'm doing, by the way, for Climate Week mm -hmm. in, uh, as a member of Climate Action Brookline. Um, mm -hmm. And um, uh, there are... Uh, you know, I would mention in particular, I, I already mentioned uh, Center for Science and the Public Interest. There's also the Environmental Working Group on one side. Then on the other side is a group called Food and Water Watch, who I believe are one of the major organizations pushing a ban on bottled water. So I would love to get representatives from any of those groups uh, debating with each other in public. That would be just fantastic. Yeah. So. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have yeah. to say, well, and I think I said this before when we were talking about it at town meeting, that, that banning the most healthy substance you get in a bottle and not banning all the other things that are in bottles of high, high fructose corn syrup juices and, and sodas and things doesn't quite make sense to me. But. And it's on top of everything else, it's all in the context of the, the operating law, uh, federal law controlling all of this, all chemicals, I guess you could say, um, uh, is the Toxic, Toxic Substances Control Act of 1976, which is a very weak act. And uh, of the probably 85,000 to 100,000 chemicals, artificial chemicals that have been developed, uh, it's really only a handful that have ever been banned. Uh, Europe, for example, has much stronger uh, protocols for banning chemicals that even if there's not absolute proof that a given chemical is, is carcinogenic or whatever. Uh, we, we, we take risks all the time. And a little bit, just looking at today, for example, um, the Greenpeace just recently tested some uh, outdoor products by major manufacturers. Uh, sleeping bags, mountaineering jackets, uh, tents, uh, et cetera. And um, 36 of 40 <coughs> of them uh, had uh, PFCs, or, or per, perfluorinated compounds, which are considered carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. right. So okay. I'm checking with my scientific expert over there. So, uh, okay. so, it's, Thank you, so Mr. it's a Harris. very live issue, yeah. and it's a very, there are three bills Currently, that were all that were proposed at the Congress uh, last spring. Um, one of them, by the best of the three, by Ed Markey, by the way, um, that have been proposed and basically um, sent to committee and no action so far. But it's not to strengthen that 1976 law. But uh, so this is a very strange time, and I agree okay. with you. So you'll yeah. you'll have plenty of opportunity yeah. to debate Thank you all this. Okay. You got it. <laughs> Okay. Quit while you're ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Mo moving on to the uh, uh, Preservation Commission, uh, is David uh, Jack here? Mr. Jack, come on up. Join us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Tell us about yourself. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Dave Jack, and I am here to offer my name as a volunteer on the uh, Historic Preservation Committee here for the town of Brookline. Um, I am a 20-year resident of Brookline, and for the approximately the last 25 years, I have worked in the architectural profession as a non-licensed architectural designer. And I, um, as a draftsman and as a project manager as well, in the areas of historic renovation, and in single family design. And for the last year, I've also been working with the local neighborhood um, uh, neighbors uh, that were interested in preserving the property located at 21 Crown and Shield Road here in North Brookline. And I was also responsible for preparing the draft document that detailed the architectural significance of the then proposed Crown and Shield Historic uh, District, mm -hmm. which is now official. Right. Um, I have spoken to Elton Elberlin, of the, uh, who I think is now the vice chair of the Preservation Commission, and also at, I've spoken with Greer Hardwick, who unfortunately I think is either retiring or has retired um, with, um, as a preservation planner, and at the um, request of Elton, I contacted you to volunteer my services. Okay. I, I noticed on your application that you're uh, interested in preserving architecturally significant examples of mid-20th century modernist residential design. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about that a little bit. Pardon me? Tell us about that, your interest there. Well. There are, um, we won't find many examples of those buildings in, in North Brookline. But, uh, in you won't find too many in local historic districts here. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are a number of uh, interesting post-war um, structures, residential structures, 
I would say in Brookline, mostly we'd find them in South Brookline. Um, and they're wonderful designs, and, and uh, I, I think that they're culturally and um, economically viable structures uh, that should at least receive some attention and um, to be looked at, not to be treated as, um, as a property that would be demolished for, <coughs> for a larger building. Uh, one of the things I also mentioned in my application is, is that I know that it's, it's um, important to be able to work with progress in developing um, um, structures, but at the same time maintaining the, the uh, essence of a neighborhood. And, and one of the things that I would like to be able to do is work with uh, homeowners in helping educate homeowners in ways that their homes could be um, saved um, and, and renovated in, in a historically and uh, environment, environmentally appropriate manner. I want to ask you about your experience uh, with our establishment of a historic district process, having just sort of worked on it a little bit with the Crown and Shield uh, Neighborhood Association. Mm -hmm. Do you find it to be a streamlined process? Is it confusing? Is it onerous? Um, are there suggestions you would make about how to make it uh, a, uh, an easier process to go through, or is it appropriately difficult? With the Crown and Shield um, uh, Historic District, I, one thing that I found that was very impressive was that you had a group of neighbors that were, um, they were interested in their neighborhood and, and yet they were also very sophisticated in understanding the process in which to be able to um, try to preserve structures in their neighborhood and try to um, preserve the, the essence of their, of their uh, neighborhood and their community. And, and I, I found working with many of the members of the Crown and Shield Neighborhood Association um, a wonderful experience because there was a lot of cooperation and uh, knowledge in the way of how to be able to effectively get a, um, a commission, um, a uh, historic district established. So my experience, on, again, only based on the Crown Shield uh, neighborhood, it, it was a very um, pleasant experience. And you found the town responsive and, and there wasn't a tremendous delay between your correspondence to the town and response being given? I'm trying to get at whether there's enough staffing in, in the preservation department to, to handle the workload. I know that in the last year there, that, um, there was an additional um, um, staff up. It should, um, I think an additional uh, staff member has been hired. Uh, but I found the town to be very receptive and s empathetic with the uh, re requests of the, of the neighborhood. Um, again, Greer was, uh, I think, quite an institution with the uh, Preservation Commission. And um, I think her absence is going to be sorely missed. But she was um, quite an asset to, for, for the town to have had. And I think she helped in developing that, that um, um, open year for the, uh, for the town in hearing the requests of the neighbors. Any other questions, comments? We appreciate you being willingness to serve. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we're not going to take a vote tonight, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know in a, okay. I guess a few weeks. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next one up, Preservation Commission, is uh, Richard Pensiera. Is Mr. Pensiera here? Um, guess not. Um, Henry Winkleman, I see you for the Commission for the Disabled. Welcome, Mr. Winkleman. Thank you. Tell Thanks. us about yourself and your interest in the Commission. 
I moved to Brookline about uh, 12 years ago. I've only been involved with the government process for about two and a half years, but I've gotten to know a lot of people and a lot about our city. Uh, if I can go take you back for a second a little bit further. I, I, uh, I worked at Clark's companies and I helped uh, develop shoe stores, open up shoe stores, but on the side I was helping to run a program called the First Step. The goal of the First Step program was to provide people with abilities, not disabilities, an opportunity to come into an active, comfortable work environment, to feel like they have value, to feel like they were earn a dollar because they worked for it. Uh, it gave them self-esteem and confidence. Uh, this helped me uh, as a person because I personally was recovering. On Valentine's Day of 96, I was locked out of my house in Alston. His police report says that I fell 30 feet head first into 18 inches of snow, Ooh. suffered a traumatic brain injury. Coma for 29 days, one week I stepped down and they shipped me off to the Braintree Rehabilitation Hospital where I lived for six months. You're, you're looking at me like in total disbelief, but it's true. Uh, uh, basically, I was given a chance by God to uh, return to earth and uh, to help other people. And I've been doing it through the first step program originally at Clark's for the last two years. As Nancy knows, I've been working very actively to help senior citizens mm -hmm. uh, find comfortable places and, and to enjoy <coughs> their lives. And now I've returned back to helping people with disabilities. I've gone to some meetings with the, uh, with the commission uh, and the current state, and I really uh, I, I want to invigorate it. I feel like at times it's disabled, and we need to re-enable and offer abilities. Wow. I have a, Any oh. questions? It's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to, I, I, you and I have talked about this, but I wanted you to confirm publicly, because one of the criteria for getting on the uh, Commission for the Disabled is they have to have a certain number of members who actually qualify as disabled. Mm -hmm. And I believe you st still qualify, uh, I, I, even though it's you've recovered in uh, I think uh, you could, uh, I feel confident in saying that you call uh, my neurologist at the Braintree Hospital, Dr. Douglas Katz. Uh, he would say that I've overcome my disabilities, but all of us are disabled. We're humans, uh, but uh, I'm no longer receiving any income, uh, and I think I've re-enabled myself. So I don't know if, Nancy, I, I don't know if I should ask Dr. Katz. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Oh, I believe that most of you know me. Do you find me disabled in any way? Well, no, wow. but I thought you said you you your doctor told you. you well, it, yeah. So I, I feel comfortable in saying that. Okay. Are, yeah. are, how rigid are we with that yeah. criteria? Uh, clearly, someone who you know has yeah. has been disabled and has learned how to yeah. deal Overcome. with that uh, right. that that situation and help others is mm -hmm. you know, I mean that's who we want. Um, yeah. seems to me. Nancy's right that there are some seats reserved for people who are either disabled themselves or are the family members of, right. of people with disabilities. Um, but it is certainly not a criteria that you be on the, uh, to get on the commission that you fit into the, either the disabled category or uh, immediate family member of a disabled individual. So, but, but I think based on what your doctor has said in the past, you could fit into that category. I believe so. Okay. <coughs> I just don't, I, I don't want to be viewed as a token, uh, someone with a disability. No. 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 No, 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 no. Well, they're the majority on the commission, so you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be a token. You'd be part of the majority. <laughs> cool. I like that. So Henry is, I am the, the selectman's representative on the, uh, on the Commission for the Disabled. Um, and uh, uh, Henry is absolutely correct. He has attended several meetings. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the, the commission is gearing up for its next effort uh, and going through a brainstorming process trying to figure out uh, what to do next, what to tackle. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can comment a little bit on what you would like to see the, the, the commission <coughs> do. Uh, either in the near term or over the, the, the longer term? I haven't really considered it. I, I, I didn't want to get ahead of myself and start planning for a party I wasn't invited to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good answer. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of have a follow-up question to that, though, because we're seeing um, people, uh, uh, some of our uh, veterans coming back to town after having fought uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan with some who've had traumatic brain in injury or, or it's dealing with 
um, some issues, post-traumatic stress syndrome and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if that's an area you might be able to be particularly helpful in, having gone through that yourself and come out the other side. I would give it my 100% of my effort. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Thank Winkleman. You. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, one last call for uh, Mr. Pensiera. Okay, then we'll move on to the uh, open air parking license, continued public <coughs> hearing on the application of Elizabeth Rodriguez for a license to conduct and maintain an open air parking lot with an area of 52, uh, 5,245 feet of 31 Boylston Street for two automobiles, lower level for overnight parking. Ms. Rodriguez. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Please speak into the mic. Uh, there you go. Good Thank night, you. everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I would like to um, to apply for the open air parking license for two cars. Um, I'm co-owner of Little Children's Schoolhouse with my sister Gladys Reese, and we do have in the upper level seven parking space, as well three parking space on the lower level. Um, the school is open by seven o'clock in the morning and closed by six o'clock in the afternoon and um, we would like to apply for two overnight parking spaces basically uh, from 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. yeah, you may have trouble getting your tenants to get out by 7. Honestly, uh, we're trying to be friendly with everybody around. They're friendly with us as well, but like uh, I brought a picture from today um, that usually is always somebody parking in the space and we don't we try to be friendly with them, like uh, leaving nice sign is there, uh, please don't park, because this is a private uh, parking space. However, I, I live in Brooklyn for many years, and I know how hard it is sometimes. Usually there are college students who they have friends coming in through the night. Usually Monday is a big day. We know that somebody will be using the parking space. And they've been requesting us to to rent out those parking spaces. That's what I'm here to ask for. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions from the board? Um, this is a public hearing. Uh, if there's anyone to speak for or against uh, this license, uh, now's your opportunity. I see none. Um, there was a, a question raised about um, uh, you're a tenant, uh, so this is being granted to you as a, as a, as a tenant, and our uh, town council has uh, opined that that's okay. <laughs> so, uh, so we do not appear to have any legal issues. Our uh, planning department has no objections. Um, we ready for a motion? I, I think so. Other than that legal issue, it seems pretty straightforward. Right. Yeah. So I will move that we grant the license to conduct and maintain an open air parking lot with an area of 5245 feet at 31 Boylston Street for two automobiles, lower level for overnight parking. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. Chair votes aye. Thank you very much. Good Have luck. a great night. Okay. Thank you. Um, one last call for Mr. Pansiera. Is right that you? Here. Oh, okay. Come on. Sorry, I was just walking. I've been sitting outside entertaining people for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, come join us. Uh, say hello. Yes, please. Why don't you tell us about yourself and your interest in the Preservation Commission? Well, um, I am a resident of Brookline. Been a resident for just the past, past two years. Uh, I'm a registered architect, about 38 years in that, doing, doing that sort of thing. Um, I've, I've always been uh, interested in building, and um, I've been working in and around preservation probably most of my professional career, either doing strictly historic preservation or working with buildings that, that have, have uh, sort of the requirement to be reused, adaptive reuse, or to re be reinterpreted, um, I, you know, I've sort of, I have the love of being able to do that, I guess, um, and, and 
you know, had been blessed of being able to participate in, in, that, in those kinds of projects. Um, and I, uh, I've loved Brookline for a long, long time and always wanted to live here. So mm -hmm. this has like been a dream of mine. And I, most recently I thought I, I should probably uh, you know, give back a little bit to the town and uh, you know, volunteer some services and get involved a little bit in what, what's going on. And I happened to see in the tab that you know, there were some openings for the Preservation Commission and I thought, you know, that's something I could probably qualify for. So that's really why I'm here. Yes. I, I just uh, I want to present another possibility to you. Um, might you be a, at all, we're sort of looking particularly for an architect to go on the Zoning Board of Appeals. The Zoning Board of Appeals, well, I hadn't considered the Zoning Board of Appeals. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I could consider the Zoning Board of Appeals, yeah. I mean, I, okay. could I think it over a little bit? Yes, you could, you could. I'd like to just plant that thought in your right, mind. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, yeah, I hadn't really, you know, I, <laughs> I think that's a different that's a different step for me, but I, I certainly yeah, I mean, you know certainly would be qualified and would be honored to be on the zoning board for appeals, mm -hmm. but I hadn't uh, I, I hadn't okay. prepared my brain. You think about it, and I'll give you I'll yet. give you a call in a couple days. All right, know. okay. Yeah, we'll and you may want to talk to uh, s uh, some of the folks in our planning staff uh, yeah. about the uh, what's entailed and the uh, time commitment. It's a it's a very different time commitment than the preservation commission. Yes, and, that's true. and the kinds of cases uh, that they would be hearing and all that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Much more involved and, and uh, yeah, much more content, I understand. But right. I will, um, I'll seek out some people. I probably know some of the people on the board. Yeah, I can <laughs> that. would be great. Um, should I, uh, will, you, will you be in touch with me or should yeah, I? Yeah, I'll give you a call and I can give you the contact information for Chris Hussey, who's the architect uh, who's on there, who's the full-time Member, so this would be one of the alternate slots. Right. But Chris is uh, 80 or something, and he's asking us to please find some other architect so he doesn't have to sit on all of the cases. I see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, well, every case needs an architect. Charge. All right. Okay. Well, that sounds that sounds fine. Um, if you could forward that information, I'd be glad to. Yeah. You know, I will do so. See what there is. You know. See what's happening there. Okay. Uh, I, I have to confess I've not been to a planning zone, planning and zoning commission meeting here. You know, zoning board of appeals. Zoning yeah. Board yeah. Of appeals, right? Yeah. Um, so Actually, it may I, be I, a good I, idea. So I don't know how you yeah. guys operate. I, you know, but I. Uh, it may be a, a good idea to sit in on one of their meetings, and they meet pretty often. There, about once a week, aren't they? Uh, no, not that often. Not, not that often. Uh, every other week. Yeah. Every other week or so, and then. Uh, but, you, but you wouldn't be sitting on every case, so you wouldn't be, have to be there every other week. So I don't want to scare you off. Right? No, no, I'm, I, I think, you know, <laughs> for the most part, I'm, I'm a homebody. I'm not going anywhere, so I, okay. I'm probably around more than a lot of people. Okay, so perfect. That doesn't really, that doesn't scare me away. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I don't know what would scare me away. Probably if, I, if, you, if you appointed me to, you know, to <laughs> so I, I want to. I want to. That was scary. Steer, steer the conversation back to the application okay, that's okay. in front of us. Yes. All right. Uh, I, I I took a look at your resume and noticed that there are a couple of projects on here that that qualify as uh, historic renovations or historic re re reuse of historic buildings. I wonder if you could just sort of comment on your experience tackling these these sorts of tough projects. Um, any, any particular project in mind? Or, well, the one that jumped out to me immediately was the, the Liberty Hotel, the, uh, the former yes, Charles I, uh, Street Jail. I had that one in mind, yes. Um, yeah, I was, um, the, the project was in our office and Bay Architects for, for quite a while, and um, I was involved a bit in the community meetings, which, um, which were, you know, sort of, City of Boston were kind of, was kind of interesting. It was, it was, it was that, between that project and the, and the Cambridge Public Library that I'm kind of getting a little confused with because they were both going on at the same time. But um, I think it was, a, it was a very difficult project to, to um, actually from my standpoint, I was a project manager, probably not the first project manager in the project. But I took the project <coughs> to design and into, into construction documents and then I, I parted ways. But, um, I thought it was a very exciting project, and I like particularly working with the developer. I don't find developers to be all that much fun a lot of times, but the carpenter company developers, they, they, were very, they were very good, very sensitive people, and wanted to do a really good job. And uh, I think that was, a, that was a feather in the, in the cap of the project. I think that's what made it go a lot more successful. Um, I know it was a very expensive project for them, but um, 
uh, that's about, you know, that, that's kind of what I remember about it, that, you know, certainly I, you know, I, it, it was a pretty strange and disappointing place to go visit the first time I went there because it, was, it hadn't been in jail for quite a long time and it was an abandoned building and um, we were just looking around to say, well, what can we do to this? How can we make this building possibly be, you know, usable building? It's just an awful place, but it took us, you know, it took us a couple years to actually work with the, you know, work with them, working with Cambridge Seven Associates who were doing the, the, the sort of live hotel part that was adjacent to the site. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course, I'm an alumnus of Cambridge Seven. I worked there for a while, so I, I knew all those guys. It was pretty easy to work with them. Um, and we had, a, we had a really good time doing it. Um, I don't know if that answered your questions, but... It did. Uh I'll pivot to another question and pick right. up on the other project that you mentioned, the Cambridge Public Library yeah. project. So one of the, the statutory authorities that's granted to the Preservation Commission is sort of interpreting the historic district and what's allowable, what's not allowable. And Cambridge has a historic commission, which is legendary in terms yeah. of its interpretations. So wondering um, your sort of interactions with, with Cambridge uh, Historic Commission and how you would... Um, adjudicate uh, cases that would come before the Preservation Commission for relief from the, the historic uh, district designation here in, here in Brooklyn? Well, um, I think that, I think that um, having that experience has kind of taught me that, uh, that sort of that you need to persevere on a lot of levels, um, you know, certainly uh, Cambridge, and I know that Brookline is very, you know, I'm sure is very much the same way. There are a lot of very well-educated people, um, well-meaning. Every community has them. Um, sometimes they, uh, they are very strong-willed, and, um, and they have a lot of really good points. And I think that um, you have to go into everything with a very open mind. When, you, know, you, you hear a lot of people stand up and speak about their issues and why things should be the way they are. And you know, I'm sure you, you obviously it's the job that you're in too as well. But I think that one of the things that I took away from it was, um, and, and these meetings get, you know, the meetings with, with the planning board, not actually the meetings with the community were very heated. You know, the people, the neighborhoods, the, um, you know, nobody wanted to touch that library building. They, they didn't want to have anything built next to it, around it, in front of it behind it. I mean, it, it, you know, it was like you, you guys, you know, we were like the enemies of the, of the city of Cambridge for a while. It felt like every time we went to a meeting, it was like, I mean, I didn't even want to go to some of these meetings. They were so, they were so contentious. But, um, you know, once again, we listened and spent a lot of time with these people and um, we were able to hammer out <coughs> enough things, you know, regarding the, how the library was going to be used when it was going to be open to the public, who was going to be able to use it, who was going to be using the playground, who was going to be parking, where were they going to be parking. You know, we had to deal with every issue. And I, and I think that um, we, and we had to sit there and listen to every issue, even though they weren't really our issues. Um, and it made me a little bit more, maybe a lot more aware that, that it's, not a, it's not a simple process to build a building. It's, it's much more, it's, it's a, you know, it takes a real community to build a good building. And I, and I have to say that, um, from, you know, I don't use the Cambridge Public Library, but, you know, from all the people I've talked to and the people that are the users and the people that the library director and, the, and everybody that lives and works there, they, they have a pretty good, very positive attitude toward it now. But um, there were a lot of bitter people along the way, I'm sure, that, you know, that really were, were glad that, 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 you know, they were able to move the ball from dead center and get something going. Because it took quite a while to get something, you know, to get something hammered out with the community. And I, and I, I, I tell you, I, you know, that's really what I, I took away from that. Yeah, that's, that would be true of many projects in Brookline also. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to, it's like I was reliving this as you were, as you were asking the questions about do I really want to do, do I really want to tell them about this? No. Um, and I wasn't on the front line, so I, you know, I, I sort of had a little bit of a cushion, but just being able, being there and listening to the people and, you know, meeting with the mayor and the deputy mayor and, the, you know, like, um, you know, everybody, everybody was involved with the project. Okay, so you, uh, Slugman Daly will be in touch. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll wait um, your response or your, your communication, and I'll 
I'll start talking some of these people. Thank yeah, you. please do. Okay. Thank you. Okay, moving on, we have our FY17 budget objectives. Just a FISM. We, we, we had a long talk about how to pronounce his name. <laughs> Everyone Wait, pronounces it differently. I it's thought okay. it was say, you say it. Faison. Faison. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. This is, uh, don't worry about it. Start putting, it's not a difficult name. <laughs> I think he's, he's giving, I think Neil's trying to give you the certain French je ne sais quoi on you, your name. <laughs> Everyone has their own spin. Yeah. Um, so uh, to make this easy, I made some edits um, and to kind of go in order of your voting, um, Selectman Daly, the, uh, the Council on Aging objectives have been moved up to objectives 11 through 14. Okay. Um, Selectman Franco, uh, we addressed yours last week. Selectman Heller, um, the gas leaks are covered in objectives 35 and 36 um, with the Public Works Department. Uh, Selectman Green, youth related objectives are 38 and 39 from the Rec Department. And uh, select men Wyshynski. Automated collection is noted in objective 37, and the aggregation project is covered in objective 16 and 17. Right. I'll note uh, for the aggregation uh, program, the uh, MAPC, the Metro Area Planning Commission, has awarded a, what, what is a blanket uh, purchase agreement. There was a, a bulk uh, a procurement uh, that we could elect to uh, uh, participate and to make that process uh, easier. We, we don't have to, but uh, that's now in place. It just happened uh, like last week, so this is very new information. And uh, picked up information about that at the MMA conference. Um, I neglected, I'm sorry, I neglected earlier in the meeting to talk about the Climate Action Brookline meeting last night, which I learned from our um, planner, Laura Curtis Hayes, uh, that the litigation, this is referenced in number um, 34, um, the litigation on uh, the gas leaks, uh, it's a class action that we're part of, and uh, is um, undergoing somewhat of a delay because National Grid has now said they want to come and reassess the issue of Brookline's trees. Hopefully that means they're recognizing that we have significant damage. And, uh, but, you know, I'm not sure what it means, but that's yeah. my hope. Yeah. Anyway, uh, at least uh, they recognize that, or at least they seem to, that that our claims are very credible, and um, let's hope that uh, we'll get some progress on that. Okay. Select Mandela. Yes, I'm very appreciative of you moving up the senior objectives, because I think that it's a big, significant portion of our population. But the, I have one little thing. Sure. We have sort of unofficially um, changed from saying age-friendly city to age-friendly community. Okay. Since Brookline isn't actually a city, it was always a kind of, you know. It's a town. Yeah, it's a town. So we've just changed it to age-friendly community uh, to cover, cover all the bases. I would present this with that edit. Okay. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Therefore, I'll can, can uh, propose. Can I make yes. one comment that Go for it. It's sort of related here? Um, the park at uh, Tappan Street uh, near um, Beacon. The name of that park. Dean Park. <laughs> Dean Park. Sorry. Um, or I think it's actually it's Wald, Wald. It's Wald Street. Waldstein well, the playground or something, and, but it's um, Dean Park. I think. It's not Tappan. I I was told on the street this this afternoon uh, that uh, some basketball courts were taken down in connection with uh, some renovation. Um, and that's a separate issue from, from, from this. But I would like to see um, in, the, in the youth section a, a little more uh, discussion of the need yes. to provide you know, recreational opportunities across the range of, of uh, <coughs> interest by youth. Um, you know, there, there's, I am told, I, I don't have the 
coordination to be any good at basketball. Well, I'm told that you know, the uh, availability of basketball courts is uh, not what it should be here in Brookline. And you know, that has a potential of having you know, sort of racial overtones. Um, I, I know that in some cities, as a way of controlling black youth, basketball courts are, are limited. I know that from personal experience because it's an issue um, when I was on a school board in Ohio. Um, so uh, I'd like to see, and we talk about expanding Brookline Youth Flag Football League, and that's, that's great, but I'd like to see in here more of an expression of the need to address the full range of, of recreational youth uh, athletic um, activities that which, we have. Which uh, uh, goal are you? Uh, I'm sorry, 38, 38 and 39. 39. 30, okay. mm -hmm. um, because I don't have the specific wording for yeah. that right now, um, and we wanted to try to get this in for our budget presentation okay. to you all on uh, February uh, 16th. Would it be okay if I reached out to the rec director and yeah. set you up to yeah. coordinate um, on that topic together? Right. Um, and then we could potentially augment yeah. the goals. And all I want to do is just raise that issue and, and let you address it as appropriate. Sure. So why don't I propose uh, the, um, the objectives as amended uh, for Selectman Daly's um, change, and then if uh, out of these discussions uh, next uh, comes some comes an amendment, we can vote that amendment next week. I think he's saying they want to get it printed and stuff. So why don't we just say vote as, it subject to amendment? At, at, yeah. He can work with Selectman Green and come up with appropriate language. Right. And we'll, we'll, we'll accept vote it. it. We'll accept yeah, it right. uh, as as they are going to amend it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so could I? I'm sorry. Could I ask one more question? Go for it. Sure. Um, and <coughs> that is, uh, what is the status of uh, the AG approval or non-approval of, uh, of the uh, community choice aggregation um, bylaw that we passed in November? Do you know that? Um, I don't think we passed a bylaw in November. We just authorized. Oh, so authorized the program. Yeah, we're just starting. Okay, so we don't need the approval of the AG for that? No, because it's not a new law. It's, okay. it's authorizing this board to yeah. enter into a contract. Yeah, and it was, wasn't it like acceptance of uh, an existing? Se existing chapter and section of MGL. Right. Right, 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 right. Okay. Okay, so the vote is what? Uh, we're going we're gonna to vote uh, the, um, the objectives. objectives as we have them with my change to age-friendly community. And 38 and 39, both it, or one? Well, it, depending on how you want to write it, but it could be an either one or both as, of them. As they will be amended by uh, Mr. Faison right. working with Selectman Green. Good. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Selectman Daly. Aye. Selectman uh, Franco. Aye. Selectman Heller. Aye. Selectman Green. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. And we have one more item, and it's the annual town election. Um, um, and there are some vacancies that we need to uh, uh, direct the town clerk to place on the ballot. And they are in precincts uh, 5 and 11, uh, a, a one two-year term in each of those uh, precincts. Uh, vacated uh, town meeting members. Uh, in Precinct 5, uh, Betsy Shore Gross uh, moved out of town. And then in Precinct 11, uh, Bobby Nabel uh, moved uh, into Precinct 10. So she'll be, I presume, running for town meeting in Precinct 10. And then there are a bunch of uh, one-year vacancies in Precincts 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 12, and 14. So we need to formally vote those. Any questions? Therefore, I'll move that pursuant to uh, Mass General Law Section 41, Chapter 41, Section 10, and Mass General Law Chapter 43A, Section 5, the following vacancies have occurred, and the town clerk is hereby directed to place on the ballot for the May 3rd, 2016 annual town meeting the following offices. One town meeting member, two-year term in precinct Five and, and eleven, precinct five and eleven, and then um, uh, a one town meeting member, one year term in precincts five, six, seven, eight, 
10, 12, and 14. The calendar is 14. 14. Yes. Yeah. The calendar is incorrect, so it's 14. <clears throat> and the calendar is incorrect on the two year term. It should be 5 and 11. Have that, Kate? The calendar, uh, I, you may not have the latest version. There was a calendar two. Uh, okay. So the, cal the most recent calendar does reflect that. Okay. Um, well, all those in favor, the motions before us, Selectman Daly? Aye. Selectman Franco? Aye. Selectman Heller? Aye. Selectman Green? Aye. And S <laughs> Chair votes aye. And we should note that nomination papers are now available in the town right. clerk's office for uh, all offices that are, will appear on the May 3rd uh, ballot, including the ones that we've just authorized to be put on the Right, uh, and then, the of ballot. course, the, uh, the normally uh, occurring three-year terms in each of the precincts. Okay, that uh, completes our business uh, for, what is today, the 26th of January. Thank you.